to Matthew 21. Matthew 21 is the parable of the two sons. This was Jesus challenging the Pharisees. And I believe he still challenges us today. I'm reading from the New International Version today. Matthew 21, beginning with verse 28. Jesus speaking. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and he went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The Pharisees answered, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. What do you think? As I mentioned in my prayer, this past week has shown to the world the foolishness of our, our Congress. C.S. Lewis, Christian author, wrote this. We have a strange illusion that mere time cancels sin. No matter how much time passes by, unrepentant sin is not canceled or excused by God. It might be accepted by society, but that only promotes more sin. Very wise man. What we have seen in these past few decades is our government and our country trying to get their culture to be accepted by God's church. By law or by intimidation. I don't know why they think they can do that. God cannot be intimidated. And he will not let his church be intimidated. Unless it is taken over by the evil one. And in these past few decades, we've seen just that happen. We have seen... Many denominations turn their back on the word and go to philosophy and psychology and current events is what they talk about, what they preach about. But please don't mention God. It scares the people. Well, we don't want to know anything about that bloody cross on Calvary because that's a horrible scene. We need to quit talking about that. We need to have everything that mentions the blood of Christ removed from our hymnals. We don't want to scare the young people. Every one of those statements I just mentioned is a true statement of a one or two denominations within our country. Unfortunately, one of those denominations is our own. 
And I'll get to that. Sin, all sin, is canceled only by faith in the Son of the living God, Jesus Christ. His name and His blood obliterates all sin when we believe in Him. The question still goes on, has gone on since the first century. God's a merciful God. He won't do that. So the question is, with the passing of time, will God forget? Will God let it slide? Will God change His mind? What do you think? Romans 6, verses 12 through 14 says this. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Rome, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its sinful desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. But rather, offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master. The church of today has got accustomed to allowing sin to remain. And to occasionally master our life. But God will change his mind. That's what we're taught. God will let it slide. He won't hold that against me because I'm a good person. We hear that. I hear that from other denominations. As a matter of fact, I read in our religion page yesterday on our paper, I read about monks, Scientology, and a United Methodist bishop condemning the nomination for the Supreme Court because she fears he'll remove our freedom of religion. Sin has no business in the church. I said sin. I didn't say sinner. Because we're all sinners. Sinners are welcome in the church. That's where the truth is shared, hopefully. That is where the Holy Spirit convicts. That is where we are challenged to do something about our sin. Hopefully it's seek Jesus Christ. But Paul said we cannot have sin being our master. Not any longer. If you have been born again, then sin has to go. Now the acts of sin are kind of easy to handle for a time. But the cause and the root of that sin, we cannot touch it. Only God can touch it. Only God can remove it by the blood of Christ. Only God can cleanse us thoroughly through and through, sanctifying us wholly, meaning completely, making us holy as God is holy. I didn't say he'd make us perfect. Lord knows as he looks at us, there's not a whole lot of perfectness here. Oh, you didn't laugh. <laughs> Time passing. This is what the unsaved and the moderately saved 
cling to and want to be true. Time passing, waiting until society changes is the snare that has been laid for all of us by Satan. This is what the enemy promotes. Don't worry about these <laughs> things. Don't worry. These times are more sophisticated now than in Bible times. Besides, everybody's doing it now, so it's okay. The world preaches and teaches this in their media <coughs> and in their public schools. Acceptance, they call it. Tolerance, they call it. It's not acceptance and tolerance of other individuals. It's an acceptance and tolerance of sin is what they're teaching. I would like someone from the world who actually believes this explain to me just when we stop living in Bible times. The Bible is still relevant, isn't it? Not according to the world. That's what they want the church to acknowledge. They want the church to say that the Bible is no longer relevant because we have misread it and we have not understood what it is really saying and time has changed what it really says. <coughs> so, let's rewrite it. And that's why the Church of the Nazarene has proponents within it for the emergent church trying to take control of this church. But just what is sin? Let's look at what God defines as sin. In Genesis chapter 3, <coughs> verse 1 through 19, God reveals sin's deception right away, the very beginning of creation. God reveals the sneakiness of Satan to entrap us. He tells us sin kills innocence. He tells us sin is pleasing to look at, as Eve said. Sin is pleasing to the senses. She said it tasted good. That is sin. Deceptive, destructive, and deadly. Because sin makes us hide from God. Just like Adam and Eve. Once Eve had the knowledge of good and evil revealed to her, she needed to get somebody else on board and involved in her disobedience. This is human nature. When everybody else is doing it, we dismiss our guilty conscience, thinking that we it can't be wrong, we can't be wrong in doing this, or no one would be doing it. So it has to be okay. Makes sense, right? To the world, yes. To those who are spiritual, it's a big lie. The issue of same-sex marriage is a perfect example of this battle with Scripture, with time, and with everybody doing it. Dennis Prager, you may know him, a conservative columnist, wrote in his column of May 14, 2012, and I quote, We regard homosexuals as fellow human beings created in God's image just as heterosexuals are. Fellow humans, yes, agree. That's not a question. Spiritual being created in God's image, yes. That's acceptable. Same as heter heterosexual activity? No, it's not.
for all humans, it's a choice. It's a choice to be obedient or disobedient. We make choices every day. Do I do it right or do I do a shortcut? Do I do it right or do I cover it up so nobody knows? We are obedient or disobedient to the statutes of God and nothing else. There is no other measuring stick. Self-will or God's will. Disobedience is sin, according to the scriptures. And unrepentant sin is punishable by eternal death, according to the scriptures. God has not changed with the passing of time, according to the scriptures. He says, I am as I am and always will be. God doesn't change, nor should the church be changing to accommodate sin. God cannot sin, nor can he condone sin. It's absolutely not in his nature. Anybody who's been in my holiness classes knows what I'm talking about. God cannot sin. He is holy. And there's no room for sin in him. Same-sex relations are not natural, and God was very specific that his creation should not partake in any such activity. According to the law in Leviticus, God's law. They would like to throw the entire book of Leviticus out of the Bible. The Holy Spirit of Christ reiterates this caution by God in, his, in Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Paul writes that such an activity, same-sex relations, is still an abomination before God and they will pay for their abomination. But it's not just that. It's the same for all sinful acts as Jesus preached with his Sermon on the Mount. He took the Ten Commandments which were, thou shalt not. He took all that negativity and he added positive things to it and this is why you should not do it. This is what will happen if you do this. God wants to protect us. Without repentance, without saving grace, without surrendering ourself to full obedience to the will and ways of God, we are lost and we are bound for hell. For all of eternity. There's no purgatory. There's no waiting space. No matter what the sin is, to God, sin is sin. It doesn't have to be homosexuality. It could be anything. It could be that lie you told this morning. That's a sin. And God's going to hold you accountable for it. Now, in our country, with the ongoing national emphasis on legalizing, recognizing, accepting, encouraging, and enabling of sinful practices, 
We need to be reminded in this country that it will not change the mind of God. It will not influence or change His heart toward sin. Any sin. He hates it all. Now, our government officials, I should probably cross that out in my notes and put clowns. Our government officials and all other governments need to be reminded that the courts, the Congress, the President, nor any other department or entity of any government anywhere in this world has the final say on what is or isn't sin. Only God does. Amen. And that's the standard by which He will judge every one of us. He always has had that decision to make. And He made it very early on. In creation. I created man and woman to be companions and to be my companion, God said. I will walk with them in their garden. I will talk with them. I will be there for them. They will be my people and I will be their God. This is what God intended from the very beginning. <coughs> Politicians. Again, I just have the plans. Need to realize they are just wasting time. They are wasting energy and money and resources trying to legitimize sin. By law or by intimidation. I don't know why they keep trying. Don't they realize they're fighting against God? <laughs> Nobody has ever won. If they read the book they're trying to throw away, they know they're fighting against God. What will be the next sin that is brought before the courts and get our political leadership involved to get behind and push through and make America accept I think pedophilia is going to be the next thing they push. You do not know how big that movement is in this country. That underground movement is so large. And it has money. And our politicians love money. They do anything for money. Because money gives them power. And they have power over us to make us do what they want. But they don't have it over God. What will they try to silence the church about next? What about the legalizing and recognizing of animals being able to be married? To humans. What about legally establishing that animals can be married to other animals? Why? A few years back, I read this in the paper. Two dogs were married in a ceremony a few years ago in New York. The cost of the ceremony was $158,000. 
One dog was from Virginia, the other dog was from New York. And here's a good kicker to this. The officiation was done by another dog. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to take my job. And why did they do this? When they interviewed the lady who was behind this, she said they were trying to prove that marriage is whatever mankind says it is. Forget about God. That was their whole point. They knew if that kind of a spread and money spent, it was going to make the news. And they knew they'd be interviewed. All right, how crazy are you, lady? And she'd be able to say why she did it. <coughs> now that was their point. And that is the point of Hollywood's mantra about same-sex marriages. Forget God. It's not about him. It's about what we want. It's about what we deserve. It's about what we choose for ourselves. It's about us being happy. Hollywood has been pushing this down our throats for years. They're getting bolder because they think the Democrats are going to take over the Congress. And they'll have free reign to push their agendas. Now, if we do get a socialist Congress, and for those of you who need that clarified, if the Democrats get control, we will have a socialist Congress. After these midterm elections, I can imagine this. Realizing who the leaders of the Democrat Party are and appear to be, they could see passing a law forbidding God to have any say in the lives of mankind. They could outlaw religion. Any religion having to do with Jesus and God Muhammad's fine. He's not a threat. They could pass a law forbidding God to have any say in the lives of mankind. The Supreme Court could mandate that now, according to the laws of man, the world, and the laws of hell, that this new law now forbids God's influence in the matters of mankind and it is a sound law and will be upheld in any world court and by the United Nations. The UN, with their wonderful leadership, could then declare Jesus Christ as world enemy number one because he's the cause of all the wars. Jesus will be charged with hindering mankind's sin experience and lifestyle choices. All law enforcement, all military and citizen watch groups will be instructed and have orders to capture and imprison Jesus on site. Good luck. Maybe that will force God into hiding, which is what they're hoping. Will the God of all creation run and leave mankind without his influence? I think not. It's still his world. They didn't take <coughs> his world. Our world and our country is becoming just like the mob in the country of the Gadarenes, if you remember the story. They demanded that Jesus get out and not come back. So much of the world wants the exact same thing. 
Jesus had saved the life of the maniac by casting out legion, multiple demons. They had been tormenting this man for years, and he had been cutting himself, and he had been wandering around the graves, naked. They tried to chain him up, and he broke the chains, and they could not withhold him. And when Jesus cast out those demons, they asked Jesus, 